I'm so, so happy to be back here and also happy to be reading with the wonderful, wonderful Roger Rosenblatt. Um, but I'm reading from my novel, The Uncoupling, but I've been feeling lately that fiction is maybe not getting its due, that people are finding their lives are so busy and they don't have time to read a whole book. So I thought I'd help you out a little bit tonight, <laughs> okay? Like if you go to a dinner party and people start talking about the plot of my book and you don't want to feel dumb, um, maybe there's a way that we could bring literature to the masses so that they don't, you know, that they can really understand it in a compressed fashion. So I have called upon a very, very special friend, and I want to say that last night this very special friend was performing with Patti Smith, and tonight, sadly, she's performing with me, but please, <laughs> please, please welcome the brilliant Suzy Roach of the Roaches. causing them to stop having sex with men. But there are a lot of characters, so Suzy thought, why not put it into a song so that everybody knows it, and then when I do the reading, you'll kind of know what's going on. But you should know that she's the singer, I'm the schmo, and uh, every once in a while, she's gonna give me the note, right? Like now. <laughs> The spell was working all through town Did they put on wigs and prance around? No, they lived in chastity Even Lee and Banerjee The women bear them Ruth and Dory Give up sex in this here story Each says no way to their men No one suspects the culprit's friend The drama teacher makes the play that makes the women turn away. And every man shrivels in hell under the Lysistrata spell. We want our life back. Oh, come on, girl. Poor boys only just begun to figure out how sex was done. This boycott spread through El Rojo. It broke up Willa and Eli, but the heavy impact of the spell was clear when Marissa Claiborne fell upon her bed, protesting war, claiming what the strike was for. No more sex, no nothing, nada. I won't be in Lissa Strong. <laughs> at the end. Would you like that? She'll return yeah. at the end. All right. So Marissa Claiborne, the one who fell upon her bed protesting war, uh, I'm going to read a section about her. Um, so there's been this spell, and it's fallen upon the women in this town. And Marissa Claiborne is a teenage girl who has the lead in the high school production of Lysistrata. And um, there are a couple of things that you should know. First, this section involves a former student at the high school, a disfigured uh, Afghan war vet who had gotten his girlfriend pregnant back in high school, and the couple, the couple got confused and named their baby Trivet, thinking they were naming it Trevor or Travis. Um, 
Also, <laughs> all the teenagers in this book uh, go online uh, to a virtual reality world called Forest, F-A-R-R-E-S-T, where they appear as avatars, and Marissa's uh, avatar is a hawk. And I think that is all you need to know. But the spell, though it had been so proficient, was nowhere near being finished. Under the arch of her canopy bed, Marissa Claiborne was overcome by it too. Had she known this was happening to her, she would have been shocked, for she was not the kind of person to be frequently overcome by anything. Common colds had rarely felled Marissa Claiborne. Sad movies tended to leave her tearless. Yet when the spell came for her, she was as susceptible as the rest of them. Marissa had been working all year at Froze, the frozen dessert place in the mall, which she sometimes referred to as cottage cheese for suckers. <laughs> the product did have a curd-like, highly textured quality as it slowly emerged from a nozzle. It wasn't cottage cheese, but it wasn't officially yogurt either, or ice cream. No one knew what it was. <laughs> Three evenings a week, Marissa sold it to customers, mostly women. Customers who admitted that the one thing they looked forward to in the evening was a cup of froze that they could put a lid on and take home, or else just eat right there in the store, blunting the pointed peak with a grateful tongue. Marissa Claiborne was one of those girls who was not interested in sweet desserts or in food of any kind, really. She'd never had an eating disorder, but had been thin and rangy as long as she could recall. She'd been given the female lead in the school play virtually every year. She was known throughout the school for her talent, her speaking voice, her composure, her good grades, and the way she looked. During ninth grade, she'd had sex with one boy, then over the summer before 10th grade, with another. She did not feel strongly about either of them at the time, but when they had showed an interest in her, she'd been curious to see what would happen. Quite a few other girls at Eleanor Roosevelt High School were experienced too. In a school like Elro, people knew things about you. It had become common and acceptable in recent years to go far with a guy or with different ones. If someone called you a slut, it was probably one of your friends saying it as a joke and you could justifiably reply, thank you. <laughs> but as the first girl in her immediate group of friends to have hooked up in any capacity, Marissa had been expected to report back to the others in detail. Willa Lang had asked Marissa a series of exhausting questions. What was it like? How would you rate it on a scale of one to 10? She didn't know how to respond, for she didn't like the idea of disappointing them. Ralph Devereaux, age 17, the son of her parents' good friends, was a senior over in Deer Heights. His posture surprisingly elegant, his skin touched with old, faint acne scars. He and Marissa had known each other since they were small and their families had gotten together for warm weather backyard parties. Her mother would light citronella candles, and the Claibornes and the Devereaux would sit at the picnic table and on lawn chairs until it grew late. Then when he was 17, Ralph returned to the house without his family, just for the purpose of seeing 15-year-old Marissa. Their first evening together was unremarkable. So what's your situation, he asked, as he drove her home from a diner in his parents' car. He had eaten a fish filet sandwich, onion rings, and a large square piece of seven-layer cake. She had had a Sprite. <laughs> what do you mean, in school? I'm in honors classes. I mean, are you in a relationship? She almost laughed. At 15, relationships were what you heard about from other people. But as soon as Ralph said it, she didn't want to tell him anything about herself. I might be, she said. <laughs> the third time he took Marissa out, he turned to her in the car and said, I'm going to be working at my uncle's paint store this summer, and then I'm leaving for college. So if you want anything from me, you'd better get it now. Kitchen's closing. <laughs> I don't want anything from you, she said. OK, whatever, just letting you know, he said. And then he put an arm around her. Marissa didn't move away, but sat under the weight of it, trying to decide what she thought. It wasn't unpleasant, but it wasn't much of anything either. She would let him keep it there, she decided, as he drove them to a defunct overpass and then parked. He said, you're cute, and put a finger on the tip of her nose. She didn't move. Then he said, now we're on the same page here, right? And she said, yes. Then he nodded gravely and cast his eyes downward toward his fly, which he unzipped with a single loud syllable. Marissa was shocked by his action, but abstractly interested. He motioned toward her. For some reason, she slid toward him. 
They sat still, and then he nodded again encouragingly and dipped his head in suggestion. She understood, and she followed, tentatively ducking down low. But as soon as she did this, he put his hands on the back of her head and steered her as if she were a video game console. <laughs> Afterward, he said, who would have thought, and then touched her nose again and drove her home. I guess the kitchen hasn't officially closed yet, he said. Shut up, Ralph. Okay, he said cheerfully. That night, she told her closest friends that they had been quietly awed. It just happened, Willa said. I mean, how did you know what he meant when he said that thing about being on the same page? Marissa couldn't explain how she knew. I just knew, she said. She got together with Ralph on two other evenings, and then eventually he thought it was time to take it to the next step. When it happened, Marissa regarded the experience of going the distance with Ralph Devereaux from somewhere high above, like a hawk circling the car. Willa, of course, begged to know everything again, which not only included the technical parts, but also the feelings, the sensations. She wanted a subjective description and a catalog of sex. She wanted something poetic. Marissa couldn't imagine what she was meant to say, but finally she just coolly said, that's kind of private. <laughs> in the summer, Ralph Devereaux started his job at his uncle's store and had no time to come over anymore, which was fine with her. But almost as if she gave off some signal that she was now more available, a boy named Dean Stanley, who was a swimming counselor to little kids at the Y, where Marissa had a volunteer job stuffing envelopes, hung around her all the time, finally asking her to go out with him. Why would I want to do that, she asked, which threw him. Because you're nice, he said hesitantly. Dean, a swimmer with greenish gold hair from pool water, was forthright in a way that was similar to Ralph. He seemed to enjoy being a young male and all it entailed, and why shouldn't he? Marissa would probably have enjoyed it too. When he kissed her with a muscly tongue at the multiplex, she let him. And when it progressed from there at the apartment he'd borrowed from an older lifeguard, she didn't try to stop it, even though she didn't feel much of anything beyond the enjoyment once again of having an experience that was hers alone and that she could master. Marissa knew that most people did not approach this the way she did. Once years earlier, her toddler brother had had to be rushed to the hospital after eating a dozen aspirins one by one. In the ambulance, their mother had said to him, Conrad, didn't they taste bad? And Conrad had said, yes, yes, they had tasted horrible. Then why did you keep eating them, sweetheart, she asked. Because, he explained as he cried, I wanted to find one that tasted good. <laughs> At age 16 now, neither of the two boys she had been out with so far had tasted good, so to speak. <laughs> Truthfully, these experiences were not nearly as intense as they were reported to be. Dean Stanley disappeared after the summer, and he occasionally texted her, but they had zero to say. So there she was now, leaning against the counter one winter night at Froze, reading the Lysistrata script, her mouth moving silently as she committed her lines to memory, when Jason Manousis walked in with his young son. Jason of the legendary Jason Manousis and Cammie Fennig high school pregnancy scandal of several years earlier. He had gotten Cammie pregnant, and then had immediately left school. Cammie had had the baby, Jason had wigged out about fatherhood and enlisted in the army and gone to Afghanistan where he was blinded in his right eye and sent back home looking like this. You're Jason Manousis, she said when he approached the counter. You graduated from Elro with my sister, she added. I didn't graduate. Well, I mean you were in her class, Tara Claiborne? He nodded and they both knew that she would say to her sister, remember Jason Manousis who got that girl pregnant and went off to Afghanistan? I saw him. God, it's sad. Daddy, I want ice cream, his son announced. If he really wants ice cream, Marissa said, I would take him somewhere else. He'll hate this. <laughs> oh, we're fine here, said Jason Manousis. But it was no surprise when, after he ordered a cup of original regular, the boy spit out the first mouthful with a vengeance, shocked. They add the tank chemically, Marissa explained. I'm not supposed to say this really, but the taste is basically fake. You're supposed to think it's got all these healthy live cultures in it, but it's got nothing. <laughs> she insisted on giving him his money back, and then she sent them on their way, but not before hearing a little bit from him about his time in Afghanistan. The war was a disgusting waste of energy and time and life, he said to her. No one can ever win it. Everyone knows that, but there we are acting like we can, he said. The war's intractable, he told Marissa. Intractable, he repeated, as though he just discovered the word. 
He spoke in a soft rush, as though they knew each other intimately, or as though the connection with her sister gave them a reason to be talking. Her sister, Tara, had barely known him. They'd been in the same grade years earlier, but Tara Claiborne had been an academically fast-tracked girl, and Jason Manousas had been a poor student with no interest in anything at the time but smoking weed and his girlfriend, Cammy. When Jason got Cammy pregnant, they'd headed off into life together, like two people holding hands and jumping feet first into a volcano. They soon became a cautionary tale about teenage sexual activity, Jason and Cammy and their mistake of a baby with that mistake of a name, Trivet. <laughs> then Jason had gone to Afghanistan, and now here he was at the mall, no longer a joke, no longer just the duncy father of a baby he couldn't even name right. He was a veteran of war with a face that could not be loved unless you also loved the person beneath it. And who would do that? Jason and Cammy were long broken up and now had shared custody of their son. Marissa ascertained that Jason Manousis was on disability and that he hoped to find a job in electronics. If you know anything, he said perfunctorily. His life, described by him without self-pity, seemed as unreal to Marissa as the life of a character in a play. It was as though he was speaking lines that weren't really true, except there in front of her was the evidence of his ruined face, and she couldn't imagine how else to make sense of it. So began their friendship. She went to work at Froze three evenings a week, and at some point in the evening, he wandered in to see her. Jason and Triv returned to the store on Saturday night when the mall was as crowded as it would ever be. Kids from the high school roamed listlessly in packs. From behind the stainless steel counter, she saw Danny Fratangelo and Doug Zwern. Danny had once tried to copy from Marissa's history exam and had been angry when she wouldn't move her hand to give him access. Why didn't you let me, he complained after class, following her down the hall. I would have let you, which was an absurd idea. <laughs> Doug Zwern was known at school as a notorious dealer of J-juice, that liquid drug that made people hyperactive and gave an animated edge to everything they saw. As Danny and Doug passed back and forth in front of Froze a few times, like a repeating loop of scenery out a car window in a low-budget movie, Marissa felt a current of wariness. Triv said, Dad, I don't want this. You don't have to eat it, her father, his father said. We are just visiting with our friend Marissa. Jason smiled a little, which pulled at the skin under his bad eye. He was challenging her, seeing whether two people who didn't know each other at all could be friends, could strike up something that had meaning. But why would they do that? What was the point? Marissa didn't know, and yet they stood there like friends, talking about the war and about Kunar province, where he'd spent a lot of time, and about the other vets he'd become friends with, a few who'd been killed, and about fatherhood. Then, as if the details of her life were remotely close in importance to his, he asked her about school and being in the play. He emphasized that she should call him if she ever needed anything, and he asked her to enter his number into her own phone, which she did, feeling generous for doing it for she was as likely to need his help as she was to need an academic boost from Danny Fratangelo. <laughs> but while Marissa couldn't imagine needing anything from Jason, she appreciated how kind he was, so much kinder than Ralph Devereaux or Dean Stanley. Marissa had her script out because she'd been studying her lines again, and Jason said, actually, you need help with that? To be polite again, she said, yeah, I do. There's this one part where Lysistrata says an oath, and the other woman has to repeat the lines back to her, you could be the other woman, Kalaniki. You don't have a guy's part for me? This is the section I have to learn. Okay, he said, I can deal. She handed him the script, closed her eyes, and back and forth they went. Her voice, as it always was when she had to read aloud, became full-throated and emphatic. Come then, Lampito, and all of you put your hands to the bowl, and do you, Kalaniki, repeat in the name of all the solemn terms I am going to recite. Then you must all swear and pledge yourselves by the same promises. I will have naught to do, whether with lover or husband. Kalaniki, I will have naught to do, whether with lover, lover or husband. Lysistrata, albeit he come to me with strength and passion. Kalaniki, albeit he come to me with strength and passion. Oh, Lysistrata, I cannot bear it. Danny Fratangelo and Doug Zwern entered the store as Marissa and Jason rehearsed the scene. She put the script down and turned to them. Hey, she said flatly. Hey, Marissa Claiborne, said Danny. I didn't know you worked here. Do you get free ice cream? It's not ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, said Jason Manusis. Hey, said Doug Zwern. 
You're Jason Manusis. Jason nodded. You served. We're supposed to thank you, man, so thank you. Jason paused. You're welcome, he said. His son danced around him, saying, can Marissa come out in the mall? Doug and Danny looked at father and son, and then in curiosity at Marissa, they clearly could not understand this scene, what someone like Marissa would be doing with the physically destroyed Jason Manusis, and they couldn't just leave it a mystery. They couldn't just thank him for his service to their country and go. They finally looked at each other in confusion and irritation, and then something built between them. The two boys twitched at each other, gearing up. Danny said to Doug, the school play is Greek. You ever learn Greek things, Doug, like mythology? Doug just looked at him. I don't know where you're going with this, Danny. <laughs> just answer me. Yes. OK, good. Who's your favorite character from Greek mythology? What? How would I know? Pick one. Oedipus. He's not mythology. You know who mine is? Cyclops. Just saying, Danny added. There was a long pause, and then Doug softly said, you douche. But still, he began to laugh, and Danny laughed too. Marissa couldn't even stand to look at Jason during this. Instead, she kept looking hard at Doug and Danny as they laughed and fell against each other, then left the store before anyone could say another word. Late that night, after her parents and her siblings were asleep, Marissa Claiborne sat on her canopy bed with the laptop open before her. She went online and searched Afghanistan and intractable, and the results tumbled in. Everyone apparently agreed with Jason's assessment of the war, or more to the point, he agreed with theirs. Despite the counterinsurgency, the allies, the whole nine yards, Afghanistan was impossible. She was embarrassed she'd known so little about the war until now that she lived in such a liberal, harmonious suburb, but had thought about the subject so infrequently, so lazily. Marissa went on to Forrest to see who was there, for it calmed her down whenever she was agitated. She soon became a hawk flying around the top of the screen where the green world gave way to who knew what. Below her was Willa Lang as a ninja, pacing back and forth in a patch of forest. Are you okay? She wrote to Willa, even though she knew this would only lead to a conversation about the breakup between Willa and her boyfriend Eli, which was all that Willa Lang could think about. Not really, Willa wrote. I knew we wouldn't last, so I had to end it, but I still feel so much for him. I am sure you know what that's like. For consistency's sake and out of pride, Marissa could only tell Willa that yes, she understood. Then Marissa took off again above the trees into the pale green sky, and as she flew, she thought that soon she might have some kind of thing with Jason Manusis. It was the right thing to do. He would be so grateful. They would go to his small apartment where he lived alone out on the turnpike. It would be a serious act of kindness. It would return him to his former self, restoring his eye, his psyche. Now flying around Farah, she spoke the line from the play, I will have naught to do, whether with lover or husband. It seemed all at once like the most exquisite and tantalizing line imaginable, and suddenly as she kept flying, she entered a dense, cold patch of air, as though the atmosphere at the very top of forest had changed. Her bird self and her girl self were now both freezing. Was it the temperature in the bedroom or in forest? For a brief and slightly delirious moment, she could not tell the difference between the two worlds or her two selves. A cold wind slapped Marissa along her shoulders and arms and face and also struck the chest feathers of her hawk's body. The spell grabbed her as she flew and she thought, I don't want to sleep with him or anyone. I have never liked it enough. I have never felt about it the way I want to. It had all been kind of a cheat. Like Willa, Marissa was suddenly done with all that. Boys knew nothing. They wanted what they wanted. Kitchens closing, Ralph Devereaux had said in his car, nervily. The one she cared about, and it wasn't sexual, was Jason Manusis. He was deformed, according to Danny Fratangelo and Doug Zwern. He was a monster. He'd once been handsome, and Cammy Fennick had liked him and had sex with him, but the war had ruined him. It was all unspeakable. The war, the destruction, and Marissa couldn't bear the sadness now. She knew it would break her down. Suddenly, on top of not wanting to sleep with anyone, she wanted to protest the war. If she wasn't going to be thought of as coolly sexual in high school anymore, then at least let her be asexual for a reason. Marissa Claiborne logged out of forest and quickly went from being a hawk to being a girl. Fully spellbound, she stood and walked to the foot of her bed, grabbing the footboard and yanking hard. The whole bed shifted with surprising ease. Just before dawn, Jason Manusis' pickup truck pulled up on the street in front of the Claiborne house, and Marissa ducked quickly outside. Her family were all fairly deep sleepers, and she turned the knob of the front door carefully. Jason got out and stood beside the truck. 
In the street lamp light, his face appeared almost normal, just a little bit ridged and uneven, and he whispered to her, this was a surprise. You said I could call. You're not doing this for me, I hope, he said. No, she said. Okay, because it sounds pretty fucked up to me, putting your bed in the school parking lot, lying in it. It's political, she said. Do you want me to explain it more? No, he said. Please don't, I'll change my mind. <laughs> he looked toward her house and asked, so where is this bed? She led him inside. He took off his shoes for silence purposes, but his tread was heavy, and every step he took made the objects in the living room china cabinet tremble and sing. From down the hall, Marissa's little brother Conrad quietly called out, Mom, and Marissa poked her head into his bedroom and said, Go back to sleep, Con. Is it morning? No, not yet. I'm presenting my findings in science today, he said. That's good. Go back to sleep. So her brother kept sleeping, and so did her sister, and so did their parents, all the Claibornes slumbering for another hour, at which point they would wake up and find out what she had done. Now Marissa and Jason went into her bedroom. She flipped on the light, revealing her white bed in all its cheesy glory. He absorbed the sight of the scroll work on the curving headboard, the tall tapering posts and the white canopy, which hadn't been cleaned in who knew how long. The top of it was probably breaded with dust. When Marissa had first picked the bed out as a nine-year-old girl, her parents had been unhappy with her choice. The canopy was a dust catcher, her mother said, and the white posts were as shaky as newly planted baby trees. But Marissa, who was in all other ways no nonsense, had wanted it, and her parents had agreed. She'd loved the bed for a very long time, and then, of course, she'd outgrown it, and she couldn't believe she'd ever wanted such a thing, but here it were, was hers until college, so she thought she might as well put it to use. It's actually very lightweight, Marissa said, and Jason Manousis walked over and lifted the footboard, dragging the whole thing a couple of feet. So it is, he said. He inspected it, gently unscrewing one of the posts from its base. Soon they were in his pickup with the disassembled bed in the back, and as they pulled away from the house, she saw the front porch light pop on and the figure of someone in a bathrobe, her mother, her father, it was hard to tell which one, for they were sometimes interchangeable from a distance, wearing the robes of a marriage. Open the door and look out in worry and confusion. The figure raised a hand now, saying stop or goodbye or what are you doing? stunned by the sight of a departing daughter in a stranger's truck. She'd left her parents a note on the floor where her bed no longer was, a note in an envelope on that rectangle of bright, startlingly unfaded carpet, telling them in her good handwriting not to worry. She said she had something she needed to do, something political rather than theatrical or academic for a change, and she would be fine. You know that I have been the kind of person to make clear-headed decisions my entire life, she wrote. Please trust me that that hasn't changed. Now the canopy in the back of the truck was like a sailboat that they were taking to the water for a dawn launch. The sun rose upon it, and all the ruffles shivered as one. So. Wow. Sherry by Colette, yep. and it's a country western version. <laughs> I heard you. Yes, yes, I heard you. But 
Can't you learn to laugh without crinkling up your nose like that? They looked at each other in open hostility. She thought for a moment, then finished aloud. You're often ugly. Hey, that's not true. Leah smiled to see him as she loved him best. Rebellious only to become submissive and chained, but powerless. Why won't you let me have that necklace? Take off that necklace. Take off that necklace. Do you hear what I say? Do you hear what I say? Yes, yes, I heard you. Yes, yes, I heard you. Time to turn the page. <laughs> and then finally, you know, because you're really going to be very busy over the course of this conference, reading and writing, you're probably not going to have time. So we basically set the last page of James Joyce's Ulysses. <laughs> this is a, a rock number. We did this one with Patty Smith last night. Can I have my notes, Ozzy? Oh, that awful deep down torrent and the sea, yes. The sea, the sea, the crimson, and the glorious sunsets. The fig tree in the Alameda Gardens, yes. And all the queer little streets, pink and blue houses, yes. The rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls. Jessamine geranium, shall I wear a red, yes. Shall I wear a red, yes. Shall I wear a red? Here's a book that's thick as a loaf of bread. It's by the guy who wrote that story I love called The Dead. Ulysses is harder to read, but worth it, they say. If only I could finish the damn thing someday. I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I, yes, to say yes. My mountain flower, first I put my arms around him, yes. And drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts. Oh, perfume, yes, and his heart 